You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number two. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast. Discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now, your host, Dr. Rene Paul Gauthier. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast. On the show today, I have an awesome conversation with performer, teacher, and host of the excellent and very popular Contrabass Conversations podcast, Jason Heath. In addition to discussing productive practice, we talk about how he built a vibrant portfolio career and became a podcasting icon by asking himself the hard questions and not being afraid to listen to the answers and take action on them. As I've just mentioned, Jason is the host of Contrabass Conversations, a podcast that is devoted to exploring music and ideas associated with the double bass. But in my opinion, it is extremely relevant to all musicians, regardless of their instruments. And I strongly encourage all of you to check it out and subscribe. It is filled with information on how to practice, perform, and live a very meaningful and impactful musical life. Both his blog and podcast are highly regarded in the music world and have been featured as top offerings in the world of arts and culture for the past decade. He is the author of Winning the Audition and Road Warrior Without an Expense Account. Jason is a highly decorated veteran teacher and keeps a busy performance schedule, playing with the Iris Orchestra in Memphis, Tennessee, and various ensembles in the San Francisco Bay Area, including the San Francisco Symphony. Jason has been an amazing source of inspiration for me for the past few years, and I'm sure you will love his enthusiasm and enjoy our chat. Let's go to the show. Jason Heath, so great to have you on the show today. Renee, I thank you for having me and congratulations on your new show. I am so excited to follow along and I'm totally honored that I'd be one of your opening guests. So thank you for that. And I can't wait to chat with you. Thank you. You know, I'm especially excited to talk to you because you've been such a great source of inspiration and motivation for me for the past few years. I've listened to so many episodes of Contra Based Conversation and I've found an incredible amount of insight and interesting ideas and tips and things I want to try in my practice and apply in my life. Uh, just incredible. Am I, am I correct in saying that you have 500 and it would be 15 today episodes out there at the moment? Yeah, we've been putting out two a week for the last year or so, and we've been going between one and three a week since 2015, um, but it, the show started in 2007, so it's been happening for quite some time now, and I'm honored as a violinist that you'd be following along, but I like to say that the kind of the, the secret of contrabass conversations is it's really not very much about the bass. I'm not actually that much of a, like a, a bass geek, even though people would think that, but it's, it's a nice way to have a niche and to just talk about things that probably relate to everybody. So though the name sounds very bass-y, uh, we probably only 10% of it is like hardcore bass geek stuff. Yeah, but even that I find so interesting. I mean, first of all, I recommend your show to all of my students and any colleague I talk to because they're universal musical ideas and concepts and so interesting. I've learned so much and it's so inspiring to hear the stories from your guests. I mean, you take someone like Leon Bosch, who's just so inspiring to hear that story. Oh, my gosh. And even when you guys go and, and geek out about bass, I always find something to learn. And as a teacher who coaches, you know, this summer I was coaching a bass quintet. These things are interesting for me to know. I find your show to be just incredible. And it's such a value that you're giving to the world with this show. And not just that, you have a really great book about audition preparation available. And it's called, very appropriately, Winning the Audition, Turbocharge Your Orchestral Audition Advice from <laughs> Leaders in the Field. 
Well, um, you got the title right. That's great. <laughs> well, I have it. I love it. I'm looking at it right now. And I recommend it strongly to anyone who's looking into maybe taking an audition or teachers out there who want to uh, maybe help their students and guide them through the audition process. I I just feel like, you know, you are giving a lot to the musical community. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And it's one of those uh Prod, the podcast to me is is a great self improvement project because it's 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 a way to kind of keep learning as as an adult musician and and doing things that I probably should be doing anyway like sitting down and learning from all sorts of people in in the bass world in the music world in general and then I get to package it and put it out to the wider world which is like an added bonus but I would want to be doing. The, these interviews that I do in these conversations anyway, even if there wasn't a podcast. And you were talking about Leon Bosch, who was the former principal base of Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. I mean, this guy, he's just a perfect example of why I like doing a podcast. He's one of the most inspiring people you'll ever meet. He retired from the orchestra to just go on this quest of, of discovering treasures for the bass the, that have been lost throughout the ages. He's put out, I think, 10 solo albums. He has this accelerated learning process for learning repertoire that's totally interesting. He also had become an ultra marathon runner, so he dropped, I don't know, probably like 60 pounds, and he's he hasn't hit 100 miles yet, but he's gotten to like 78 miles. And I just got a chance to interview him for a round two in Italy for during the European Bass Congress, and we talked all about his learning learning process. So, uh, yeah, look, look for that soon. And that winning, winning the audition book, that's an example of what's kind of cool when you get an archive, like I've got with a podcast, I, I realized a couple years ago that we'd been kind of circling around a lot of the same topics with these guests and how interesting would it be to put together something about a specific topic from all these different voices. So I took, Oh, I took like two weeks of my life and I listened back to my own podcast, like from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which no, nobody, that, that's a torture I would not wish on anybody, like listening to me stumble <laughs> through the first few episodes. But I cataloged all the topics that we talked about for like the first 200 episodes. And then I, I, fortunately, I, I found a wonderful, a uh, kind soul named Krista Copper, who is doing that cataloging now. So now, when I, there's a topic that I think would be interesting to kind of dive into, like auditioning with that book, or I just did one on advice you would give to your younger self, and I've got some other ones in the works, I can go through and kind of suss out those five-minute chunks, and you get this amazing tapestry of all these different voices from different states and uh, countries and continents about a similar topic. So those are some of the many cool things about having a podcast. And I would recommend anybody <laughs> listening, start a podcast. It's, it's way harder than you think, uh, as Renee could probably attest to, but it's, it's such a great self-improvement project. Oh, I agree. Wow. Can't wait to hear more about these upcoming writing projects you have. But tell me, you're a performer and an entrepreneur, podcaster, a blogger, a teacher, a host, an author, a lecturer. Seriously, what do you not do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't hold down a full-time job anymore. And so that allows me to have space for a few more of those titles. But I'm really enjoying the, the variety that comes with what I do. But yeah, I, I play the bass and that's definitely one of the hats I wear. And currently I you know, sub in the San Francisco Symphony. Some I play in this orchestra down in Memphis, Tennessee called the Iris Orchestra. And then I've sort of developed this a uh, quirky career that 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 sends me around the United States and abroad, and I do guest master classes in clinics and performances. So yeah, bass is is uh, the kind of the common glue for all the different projects I have. But I definitely keep myself busy. That's really incredible. It's it's such a rich career that you've built, and. I think you're an amazing example how of how um, one can create a rich musical life like this by really taking ownership, not being afraid of trying new things and continuing to grow, as you said, and create. And 
I find that that's my opinion, but I, I feel like you've paved the way for musicians to find their own voice and create their own platform. You know, you've built this worldwide community of people coming together to learn. And as we talked about, not just about the bass, but about music in general, I think it's, it's just incredible. So can I take you back a little bit? Would you mind telling us about your story, how you got started and how and why you became a musician and how the career has evolved into what it is today. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to talk, so I'll try to keep this brief, but we can go down a lot of different uh, rabbit holes on this if, if you want. Um, I have a lot of people will identify with the path I had. I grew up in South Dakota, which maybe not a lot of people will identify with, a lovely part of the of the United States. In Sioux Falls, South Dakota, got into bass when I was a teenager, started on violin, like a lot of people, and uh, was not, you know, kind of chilling in the back of the seconds. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, some of my favorite people <laughs> are doing that, but that was me. And found the bass, started playing. It, actually, I wanted to uh, quit orchestra and start playing uh, just rock. And I was playing electric bass, and I was in this band called, which is a wonderful teenage named Toxic Death was our band. And then we changed our name from, from Toxic Death to Committed, which is a slightly slightly uh, less ferocious sounding name. I think we were probably 14 at the time. So, um, but I wanted to quit orchestra. My mom and dad said, no quit orchestra, have to play, uh, but you can play a different instrument. So I moved over to double bass. Fast forward, I don't even remember the last time I played electric bass. Fell in love with the upright bass. Ended up going to Chicago, which is one of the, probably the closest really big city to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and started studying with Jeff Bradetage, a wonderful bass teacher, someone who's done a lot for the bass world, and and found myself at Northwestern University in Chicago, and did a bachelor's and master's, and kind of did I did well at several auditions uh, during the end of my master's and kind of got connected in the freelance world in Chicago and found myself subbing with the, the major groups there and getting into some regional orchestras and built up the, uh, what we would now call a portfolio career of, of probably, I think I held down four contracts and I played with another half dozen orchestras, started teaching at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, which is 92 miles away from where I was living. So I had some lovely Wisconsin drives and you no, know, Renee, you've spent time in Wisconsin. I played in a festival called the Midsummer's Music Festival, also in Door County, Wisconsin. So I had some wonderful time up there and uh, met my wife, uh, who was a harpist, is a harpist, I guess. You're always a harpist. But one day she came home and she said, I'm done with harp. I don't want to be a harpist anymore. I want to go to medical school. And, and I thought that was, uh, I was, she always sort of threatened to quit everything and go to medical school, but she was really serious this time. And, and she was serious. She did that. Uh, and I started to kind of look ahead at what the Heath finances would look like with medical school in the equation. We were both pretty successful freelancers, and I realized that that math looked really bad um, over the long term if she was going to you know, take on the loans for medical school and all that. So I decided to go back and start teaching high school. I, I went back to school at DePaul, got certified to be an orchestra teacher, and I spent seven years, so, uh, so like a nice little mini career of, of teaching orchestra, and I loved it. And, the, and, and right around that point was when I decided to go back to school, I also decided to stop taking orchestra auditions, which makes sense. Uh, and I found myself with all this time on my hands. I've been spending like four hours a day practicing, five hours a day, six hours a day, whatever uh, standard I thought you were supposed to live up to. And all of a sudden, I felt like this burden had been lifted. And I start, tried to figure out what to do with myself. And I, I spent some days just kind of wandering around Chicago. I remember I went to like the Art Institute and I walked on the lakefront and I was poking around on the internet and I was still private teaching and I knew I was getting more into teaching. So I started to 
think more and more about resources for my students and like even ways to just effectively share like what my students are working on with their parents and that kind of thing. So I started a blog on blogger uh, of all things. And, and it was a student resources blog. And it's just this weird set of circumstances where I started to enjoy it. And I started to actually write a little bit on there and it started to get noticed. I had a site track tracker on there and I noticed, oh, I've got 20 people a day coming to this site. And then I've got 50 people a day coming to this site. Now I've got a hundred and now I've got 200 and now I've got 300, whatever. And I started to write a little bit about the, about what it's like being a gigging musician. And part of why I did this was because I knew I was getting out of that, or I thought I was getting out of that. And I thought, what have I got to lose? I don't care if I burn these bridges. I'll just <laughs> tell the, tell the truth. And that started to resonate with people. And I kind of, I had a really good story, uh, which I will share in the 30 second version, uh, cause that could take a long time, but I had a, a car fire driving home one night from a gig in Northwest Indiana. And I, the car fire, what happened was the undercarriage of the car caught fire. So I was driving on the road. I smelled smoke. I looked behind me and my back seat was on fire with my base in the flames. And I pull the car over, I get my base out. The car explodes like the movies. Um, the fire department comes, it's a whole thing. Um, and I, there's some humor in it looking back. But I, I, I had never told this story publicly. So I finally told that story on my blog. And that sort of blew up after that. And then it went from uh, a few hundred people to like over a thousand people every day. And I got feature. I, re I remember a high moment for me was when the New Yorker linked to something I'd written. I thought, okay, that is officially cool. Uh, got featured in International Musician and all that. Yeah, and that was like mid-2000s. And 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 right around then was when I got started to get into podcasts. I just liked listening to podcasts, and there was a base podcast that had already we use the term pod faded. It had existed for seven episodes. Like, this guy was really early. Peter Jones, the double base cast. Shout out to Peter. Uh, I've asked for him to be on the podcast, and he's never <laughs> returned my messages. So Peter, I'd love to talk to you, but um, he. Uh, so there was nothing there. I thought it would be cool to do. And I started it up and loved it. Had no idea what I was doing. Uh, super cringeworthy to listen to my first episodes. Not that I obsessively go back and listen to my old episodes, but on the occasions I have, I'm like, oh dear, Jason. Um, and then I got a full-time job teaching high school, got into that world and kind of put those projects on the back burner and fast forward through that lovely seven years of teaching. My wife ended up getting her residency. She's a radiologist, her radiology residency in San Francisco, where I now live. And I thought, first of all, oh no, moving. And then I thought, oh wait, moving to San Francisco. That sounds awesome. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I kind of figured it out and it, and, and I was thinking it was a nice moment. I was also turning 40 at that moment. So it, it was a nice moment to just kind of look back on these two little career mini arcs I'd have about seven years of freelancing, about seven years of public school teaching. And then just kind of think, what did I like the most? Or what did I think really connected the most? And I, sadly, I got to say, I, 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 w I wanted to say that it was the teaching and the working with the kids and everything, the day to day stuff that, that I felt really had the most impact. Um, because I, I'm a social person and I love hanging out with people and getting to know people. But if I was really honest at that moment and I looked, I realized that the impact the podcast had made more than the blog, um, long term, that was what really, uh, seemed like was the, the most valuable thing I'd been doing those 14 years. So I thought, what if I just went all in on this podcasting and just let see what happened. And if I have to walk dogs, uh, I'm terrified of big dogs, but I'll figure it out. So I could do that in San Francisco or whatever. And I just went all in and the podcast took off. Uh, it was kind of a different era for podcasting. I started in 20, 2007. This was 2015 when I got it going and it's led to a really interesting career. So I've, I'm a consultant for a variety of different companies now. I'm the 
product manager for basses for Eastman Strings, which is a large instrument company. And I go around and uh, do pro- help with product design and artist relations and speak at events and through them. I work for uh, another company called Musicians Toolkit, which is an online learning company. And I'm on their advisory board and I film content for them and help find uh, people in the orchestra world in general to, the, to connect them with and to potentially film content with. I work for another music advocacy organization called Be Part of the Music and another two or three companies and continue to play some bass, uh, teach uh, at various programs, some of which is through the San Francisco Symphony here. So that's kind of what I do. I've realized that I've already talked for too long. So I will, <laughs> that's my, that's kind of my arc. That's uh, what I'm up to these days. Ah, this, this is so great. So awesome. And what's fascinating and what I love so much about it is hearing, you know, I love stories about musicians because it is always so inspiring, but seeing how it evolved so organically from you listening to yourself, asking the hard questions and uh, not being afraid to look at the answers and reinventing yourself. I feel sometimes we are, you know, maybe putting ourselves in boxes and we're so afraid to leave places that seem a little bit safe. But I just, I find that your story is so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, the the real quick one thing that I realized even back in 2007, 2008, right around there, about a decade ago, is I I thought by starting that blog, I I was willfully thinking I was going to terminate all my connections in the performance world and the bass world. I was turning my back on that. I thought I'm just going to write about this and whatever. Uh, Who cares? But by being honest and doing that, that actually raised my profile as a basis trem- tremendously and it actually led to uh, I kind of leveled me up in the base I started to get way better gigs and it's just sort of funny by just deciding to go a different way and not caring what other people thought so much when I look back on it. It's really easy to look back and write your own biography and things look much neater than than they do in the moment. But uh, that really, that just decision to not try to fit in uh, actually led to all sorts of great opportunities that I never in a million years imagined would have happened. I think that's a powerful message for all of us to hear, for sure. (laughs) Jason, how about we talk about practicing a little bit? Um, And I'll admit that I don't even know where to start with you because with your background as a performer and a teacher and an author, and you know, I I should say, by the way, I've heard about how you were as a teacher and you are definitely one of those that leaves a very strong impression on your student. I've heard from some of your old students and the way they talk about you is so... It's kind of touching, actually. So, you know, know. but yeah, so you are a teacher, you're an author, as I said earlier, and you're someone who's interviewed hundreds of incredible artists and someone who knows so much about practicing mindfully, intentionally and efficiently, and then wrote this great book. What what are some of the things that you've learned throughout the years, posting the podcast, writing your book and your course? Yeah, that you still have a course out there too, right? I do. I have a much better. Co- oh, I do, and it's and it's completely free. I can I can share a link with you if if people want to check it out. It's just about kind of building your own building your own platform. I have another course coming out uh, that's base specific. So if anybody wants to check that out, it's through Musicians Toolkit. Should be launching this fall. Um, but yeah, I thought a lot about practicing and moving to San Francisco and and clearing the calendar of all the obligations that happen when you just live somewhere for 20 years. It actually was a great moment to get back into practicing the bass. I will admit during those high school years, practicing was never priority number one. It was not even priority number 10 a lot of the days. But I, I was teaching bass at DePaul University during that time and just and continuing to play. And the shame of sliding into being that person that no one really wants to sit with or that person who, oh yeah, they used to be good. Twenty, You know, I didn't want that to happen to me. So for just the sake of professional integrity and for the sake of my DePaul students, I still kept playing, but I have had such a great time 
kind of falling in love with practicing again out here in San Francisco. And I mean, I, I guess the short answer to what have I learned about practicing is there are no shortcuts. And anybody who has achieved something of significance, getting from a real clear point A to point B, uh, they put in a lot of the right kind of work. And, and so something I started to do back in 2015 was when somebody won a professional orchestra position in the bass world, I would schedule an interview and talk with them. And I would dig into how, how'd you get that job? basically was the, the and what did you do specifically and when did, when you when you saw that audition announcement like how did you plan out that time and how did you uh and down to the nitty gritty like what did you do in the first 20 minutes what did you how much did you use visualization how much did did you taper before the audition? Did you um, did you start at a, a slow tempo and work up over a period of weeks? Um, all those things, by the way, are commonalities. Most, but not all, people did something like that. But it, I definitely noticed there was tangible evidence that they had progressed and leveled up as a player. Um, th- there were things in common, and it was it was definitely methodical. So yeah, it, it it's really interesting to see both what's similar and what's different for for anybody in music but especially for those audition winners i just think it's really interesting to I, they're they're like our olympic athletes i think because winning a winning a job in the san francisco symphony or the chicago symphony or what have you that is uh I think, uh, you know, on par with making the Olympic team and anybody who's done something like that has, they have figured something out. It has never once, maybe it's happened. I'm sure it's happened, but not in any of the conversations has it been, I don't know. I just showed up and I just, you know, practice a little bit and there we go. And I got it. Uh, It was, it was a path of, you know, at times frustration and disappointment and a lot of aha moments, which I always find fascinating. A lot of, not everybody, but pretty much everybody, almost everybody had a moment that something clicked and they went from not advancing to advancing all the time. Or they, and those aha moments generally had to do with the methodology behind their practicing. Common one is starting to play for other human beings, live human beings on a regular basis. That is very commonly what kind of triggered that aha moment. Uh, Starting to record yourself, starting to believe in yourself and just allowing yourself to be authentically you, which sounds maybe a little woo-woo, but I think, but I've heard many times that people, they couldn't figure out why they weren't finding success with whatever doors they're trying to open audition wise and the and what 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 it was was they were trying to do what they remember their teacher telling them to should be done or they were trying to play to some sort of imaginary trying to trying to fit in some box and just didn't really fit them and if they just allowed themselves to be a little more themselves whatever that means that was what Open, open the door. Joe Conyers, who's assistant principal base of the Philadelphia Orchestra, runs an amazing nonprofit in Philadelphia called Project 440. He's the conductor for the Philadelphia All City Orchestra. He had that kind of moment where he just decided to let it all hang out and be himself. And I remember him telling me he just decided to have fun in auditions, which sounds kind of nuts if, you, if you've taken auditions. But Joe, he got to the point where he would be smiling and almost laughing laughing as he was playing, which must have looked pretty wild to the proctor. And Joe is a big guy. He's a bodybuilder. So I I can only imagine what that looked like. But that realization really opened, opened the doors for him. So yeah, I've learned a lot. But I think, yeah, to sum it up, there are no shortcuts. And anybody who has achieved something on their instrument has has put in consistent and mindful that's a good word uh work i agree with everything that you just said <laughs> you know and and that resonate on <laughs> with me on so many levels one thing that you said keeps coming back in the conversations that i've been having with uh, some guests on the show is so important i find is falling in love with practicing and this is not something mm-hmm. that we 
talk about so much with our teachers, but I find as I grow older <laughs> that I enjoy practicing much more than I used to. And mm -hmm. of course I have a lot more experience, but I also get my best results when I am having a lot of fun in the practice room. And for me, that just involves practicing in the way that fits my needs, practicing in the way where I'm very present, but also allowing myself to be creative, to devise new exercises and just have more fun with it. I think that's really key. I, and I, mm -hmm. I love how you worded it, falling in love with practicing. It's so true. Mm -hmm. And also what you said about the right kind of work. I use this analogy a lot, but so many students I find often will step in the practice room and say, okay, I'm going to be in there for an hour. And then they play and they move their fingers, but they're not necessarily present. There's not really a clear plan or there's no strategy present or, you know, very little strategy. And that to me is not practicing. That would be, that would be playing but not necessarily practicing and in really focusing on the right kind of work. And, you know, the other thing that really resonated for me in what you said is when you talked about, you know, believing in yourself and being authentically you, I have taken my fair share of auditions and, you know, I've been lucky enough to have successes and I feel that it was always on the days where I would, um, you know, I was very methodical in my approach in not just learning the material, but also doing the, the work of the mental practice. Back at New World Symphony, I had the opportunity to work with Don Green, which completely changed my life. And, mm -hmm. you know, the mental aspect became a very important part of my preparation. But on audition day, it was always... You know, what do they say now in 2018? Uh, be you, boo, I think, you know. <laughs> but it was just to go out there and do my thing, play as beautifully as I can, and really um, feel the joy of playing while I play. And these were always my best days for audition. And thank you so much for all of this. You know, how... Yeah. What, what do you think are some of these really helpful tips that you think would really help someone, either a student or young professionals, to make their practice more mindful and efficient? Well, it's it's great timing. I have a great I have a great tool I've discovered within the last two months that has really transformed the way I'm working, and I've I've been I've been shouting it to the rafters uh, as much as I can. And I've got my students using this too. And before I talk about that, I do, Don Green is awesome. If people aren't familiar with Don, he's got three great books. I had him on my podcast. He'd be a great get. Don loves to chat. So, I, and then there's a, another performance psychologist uh, named Amy Baltzell who works through Boston University. And a podcast listener of mine uh, connected me with her recently. And I just had her on, uh, I haven't put it out yet, but I had her on my show. And I, and she's wonderful. And it's it. There's so much we can learn from the world of athletics. And I think athletes are and and athletic performance. They're further along than than we musicians are. There's a lot of money in athletics, you know. So who knows why? But and if we even look at how people are working out in the gym, you know, I go down to my gym here in the building, and I, I think at least half the people have some running on their phone that's tracking and helping them to be more deliberate or mindful, we could use those words, working out. And so kind of in that vein, I have discovered this amazing app called Modacity. And sadly, only available for iOS. They want an Android version, but they need to get some crowdfunding or something for that. So iOS only. So I apologize to non-iOS people, but oh my goodness, this thing is the best thing I've found for teaching deliberate practice. And it's, it's subtle. It, it, the, so Mark Gelfo is the CEO and founder of this, uh, of Modacity. And he is a French horn player, went to college not for horn, but for computer science and then switched to cognitive science. Okay, so mindful kind of world. And then did go to Indiana University, got a master's in horn, and then got a job in 
the Hong Kong Philharmonic. I think he was briefly in the oh some other orchestra right before then, but was in Hong Kong for five or six years. Moved out to California, uh, chasing a girl. That's a that's a story that we talk about on my podcast. And and got into the scene here in San Francisco. Became the first call horn sub for the San Francisco Symphony for years and years, and he still plays a lot with them. And he has designed this app with with practicing deliberate practice is what he calls it uh in mind and it's kind of like a workout app for your practicing but it is set up so so well to make you mindful and i'll just briefly share a few things and they're they're subtle you don't even realize that it's changing the way you practice, but it, it does. And the first thing is you start it going, you create a playlist, just like a playlist in uh, iTunes or Spotify or whatever, of the things that you want to work on, the pieces. So you've got your pieces. They're just like a song in your playlist. You arrange your playlist. You can have as many playlists as you want, but I've got one called Main Routine. So I start it off, and the first thing on there is technical, base technical fundamentals. I don't remember what I call it, something like that. But it's going, and there's a timer counting up. Or if you want, you can say 10 minutes and it'll count down. And I can't tell you how cool it is to have just that as I'm practicing, I'm seeing that time. That alone makes me more mindful because I realize like, oh, I've been doing this for three minutes. What what am I doing? Um, Below the timer is a microphone icon. And Again, I opened this up and I thought, oh, that's interesting. All I'm seeing is timer and microphone. Why, why did they do? And then I have started recording myself so much more than I typically did. I've recorded myself more in the last two months than I probably have in the last 10 years just because that's there. And it's, it's set up so simply. You press the record button, at record, uh, you press stop. It just immediately plays back what you did. And then it'll just delete it or you can save it. Wow. And that recording is a so yeah, right? And that recording is associated with that piece. So you're building an archive of how you're doing. And I have been going back. I'm working on this Capriccio number two, this thing for, for bass, at which I played for a long time. But I, I and I usually just kind of dust it off before I have to play it. But I thought, well, let's actually let's try to let's try to track us. You know, what gets measured gets managed. It, 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 and I, it's been so interesting going and listening to a recording I made from two months ago. Now, could I do this without this app? Sure. Absolutely. Could I run a timer? Sure. Could I record? Yeah, I have a bunch of devices. But just having that together is really useful. And then uh, it all also has this really cool thing called the Metro Drone. So it's a drone and a metronome, and it will do all the subdivisions, and it will drone as it clicks. So all useful things. And um, just the little details. There are the things that, that show that a musician designed it and that a musician's really thinking about all the little stuff, like the tap button to find a tempo, it works really well, way better than my Dr. Beat would work or other apps I use with similar functionality. And then finally, it's tracking all that stuff so you can go in and it gives you all your stats. How, oh, oh, oh uh, um, actually, before that, it, then it has, this is the best part, actually, it has what's called deliberate practice mode, which is a kind of AI that inter, that that interacts with you and, and you press the deliberate practice mode. It's like, what do you really want to dig into? And it gives you some suggestions, uh, free and relaxed playing, you know, better accuracy, what have you, or you can enter your own, which will, it'll then save. And then, so like, let's say, uh, free or playing, and then it'll say, okay, how do you want to work on that? And it'll give you another set of things it suggests. Um, and you can type your own, but I find that those suggestions, they're, they're thought out from a mindful, uh, cognitively intelligent way. And, and it's a really good way to just sort of subtly make you focus on good stuff. And it, and it, then it says, okay, record yourself. And so I press and I'm, and I, I first did that. And I thought, I don't want to record myself doing this, but it's telling me to, okay. And I have found that rather than just kind of mindlessly notching up the metronome, I've, I have been kind of targeting specific things and that app is making me think about them. And then I record myself and it really makes, because I mean, talk about how, you know, it doesn't get any more objective than that, recording yourself and listening back. Um, I am solving problems more efficiently and quickly 
and I'm, I'm repeating stuff in a more uh, mindful, intelligent way when I am repeating things. I, I'm, I, and, so, and then finally, it's tracking all of this. So you can look at how, what did you do today? What did you do this week? What did you do last week? How are you doing each individual piece? It, it shows you how many times did you deliberately practice this and what did you do? You can look at all your recordings. You can set a reminder when you're done with your session for a specific time uh, the next day. You want to practice at the same time, and then your phone will remind you to practice. Okay, so you can see the, how useful this could be for anybody at any level, from the most professional you know, kind of le- level imaginable to your 9-year-old or 10-year-old. You know? So anyway, Modacity. Whoa. And even if you don't have a smartphone or you don't want to um, go that way, go modacity.co. And Mark has a great blog where he is writing every week about mindful practice. So there's a resource I'm really enjoying. Wow. I think that I need to talk to this person. I feel like he lives in my head. <laughs> you, know, it... <laughs> you would have a great conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, you just uh, you t- talked about all the things I have in my doctoral dissertation. This is this is incredible. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, let's hang up. I got to go. Um, just kidding. But wow, this is incredible. You know, you're, you're talking about, I mean, I, I really want to go investigate this now. Um, if... If you make it easy, then it happens. It's so great that all of this is together. And, you know, you're talking about the timer. Mm-hmm. And if you study with me at home, I teach at a university, but also have students at home. And they always wonder why there's a, a timer on my stand. And I love practicing with the timer. That's one way that I set up challenges for myself. And for things like a, a warm up regimen, I tell them, I heard this great quote from Simon Fisher where he talks about everything in music is a little bit like medicine. You take a little bit, but Mm -hmm. you do it every day. And that's why I tell them, don't skip the long tones. Don't skip the exercises. Don't skip the scales. If you don't have a lot of time, just do a little bit less, but plan ahead. And that's sort of what I do. I'll look at, I'm going to sit down for an hour. I'll do, even if it's just 40 seconds of long tone, there's something to be, something to learn from doing that 40 seconds. And I'll set up my timer and I'll be like, okay, a minute of this, two minutes of this, 15 minutes of scale and so on and so forth. And for me, the timer is a great tool to keep me present, keep me motivated. And when preparing for auditions, you know, if you have a list of 18 excerpts and you only have so much time to practice, but you want to touch each one every day, then, you know, you say, okay, I have my excerpts that I'll spend 10 minutes on and then so many I'll spend five minutes on and these are going pretty well. I'll maybe spend a couple minutes on this one today playing it through and maybe recording it once. So that I think, you know, it's and having that recording button right there, like you say, it's if it's easy, if it's there, you're more likely to do it. And uh, yeah, this I, I've I've got to talk to this person for sure. Oh, it is, it is, it's the app of my dreams. I mean, I can't, and I, I don't work for them. I swear I'm not getting paid by, but I am I'm freely. So full disclosure, you know, but, but oh my goodness, it is, it is, it's the sort of thing that I have wished for so long was there. And, and it's so like, I, I'm, I'm finding that if I'm drinking the Kool-Aid like this uh, <laughs> and it's, it's really, it is such a useful, like I had, it's making me practice, it's making me practice when I have, when I, on days that I wouldn't normally, because I like yesterday was a great example. I, I had a really full day and I had literally 30 minutes. <laughs> I, and so what I did was I built a 30 minute routine and you can eat, you can set those timers to be just free and they go up or you can set. So it's like, Oh, I'm going to do this for five minutes, this for 10 minutes, this for five minutes. And it just flows right into the next one. Um, it, it, it says, okay, stop. And you, and you evaluate how you did on everything. So it keeps a star rating too, for how things are going. Um, which, and then you can track and look and see how everything's going. And I, I got so much more done in that half hour than I normally would be because that app was keeping me on task mm-hmm. and it, it really, yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And again, even if people don't have, it's free, but even if people don't have uh, an iPhone or iPad, um, there's a lot to be learned about mindful practice on the, on their site. And I just put together a walkthrough video of me and my own practice routine. It should be at contrabaseconversations.com slash modacity, or it will be if I haven't put it up there yet. But 
Um, yeah, it's really, it's cool stuff. I'll put a link in the show notes with all that good stuff. But did you say it was free? Yeah, it's free, and they're tr- there. So, like, how will they exist if it's free? Is a, a valid question. There's then there's a, a subscription that you can do monthly. I think I think it's like eight bucks a month or something like that. Um, that then gives you additional functionality. Wow. Um, so I think I think everything that I talked about is in the free version. Maybe maybe it doesn't give you as comprehensive stats, but all the recording and all that is, is in that. And then long-term, it's the stuff that will blow teachers' minds and players' minds. They're, they're looking at doing like practice packs. Like what you could right now, you could take your student's phone and build the perfect practice routine or a, a, a useful practice routine for them. Um, how cool is that? How often have we as teachers wish that we could be there hovering and say, no, don't do that. Go to this next one. Uh, and then you could look and see how they're doing that they're long-term they're, they're looking at, uh, you being able to offer up your own routines and materials in app um, that people can then download as packs. Um, how cool would that be to have like Suzuki book one, the pack, you know, like the practicing s- schematics. Um, and so the sky's the limit with something like that. It's early days. They launched eight months ago, I think. Wow. So this is a new, new stuff, but it's exciting to, because it's the sort of thing I have for years. I even have somewhere in my Evernote, me trying to sketch out some app like what I'm describing. I thought when I moved out to the Bay Area, boy, living in tech, tech world, maybe I should try to work on something like that. And I just, it was too complex for my poor brain and I couldn't, um, I didn't do anything. So I'm, as you can tell, excited about that. But I think it's, it's something that anybody interested in mindful practice, whether or not they have an iPhone, uh, should dig into. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I haven't looked at the app yet, but if it's everything that you just said, I, it's like you say, you know, this will be the holy grail of practicing apps because, you know, yeah. I think that going back to taking ownership of, of your career and your practice, I been discussing a lot lately about how as students, sometimes we go in the lesson and hear the teachings, but then going back in the practice room, we really need to take our own learning into our own hands. And I don't always see that mm-hmm. happening be in, because of the abstract nature of practicing. Some people are sometimes having a hard time structuring a technique. I think that, um, you know, my students are definitely going to hear about this this year. Get ready, people. <laughs> and um, But yes, I'm going to look into that. Thank you for mentioning it. It sounds amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so practicing so hard because it's it's uh, it is an abstract thing. But what what I love and I always try to talk about with students, if I can, if, if, or and certainly their parents, but like pra- learning how to really practice well on an instrument. Talk about a skill that carries over to all other aspects of life. You're learning how to problem solve in this really. Uh, in this way with real tangible results, right? You can hear, sense, t- touch it. You can, uh, it's um, b- learning how to play with a straight bow or a good spiccato or a relaxed vibrato or play a movement of Bach. I mean, those are, those are demonstrable, achievable things and, and learning how to think, <laughs> it, which is really what practicing is and how to go through something that's long-term and logical and requires all sorts of different kinds of problem solving. I mean, that's just, that's what, that's, that's the thing that machines are going to replace the last. So as we move into a world of ever increasing automation and the demise of jobs and, you know, what have you, uh, um, those, those skills become ever more important. (laughs) And, and so I think, I think there's a strong case that you can argue in terms of music being more relevant in today's world than ever. And, a big part of it is that that the cognitive benefits of learning how to do something like practice an instrument. Yes, absolutely. And you know, with everything that you know now, like if you have, let's say you have an ideal time, you have a free day and you have a time to do a really good practice session, what could that look like for you? Yeah. And I, um, uh, for, for me, morning is my best time. And I, right now I try to, I, 
I look at myself as a bass player, kind of, that's probably like my third or fourth role in life. I am practicing every day and I am still doing that, but really like um, for good or bad or whatever, I, I feel like I have more value to give in the sort of business roles that I have. So I actually start out my day. Now, were I auditioning for the Chicago Symphony or do, or playing a concerto or were that my my first role in life, I would start with practicing. I would go to the gym, I would make breakfast, I would eat, I would, you know, take, take a, a moment. I use my Apple Watch, one minute uh, kind of faux meditation thing. I know it's not really, <laughs> med- but, it's, but it's better than nothing. I, I do that and then I do my work. So in my case, I sit down and I do three 25-minute sessions. I've got a Pomodoro t- timer going of what's the most important work I need to do, I want to do, not on my base. So I don't check email. I just get out a pad and I write down, I I dump everything out of my brain. And then I find the three things that are important but not urgent tasks like writing a blog post, like um, putting together one of these winning the audition type podcast episodes and stuff like that. And I I do 90 minutes. So I do 25 minutes, take a five minute break to stretch. I do that to start my day. Then I break up the base and I play... um, I start with, well, I could go get my Modacity app and read down exactly what I do, but I, I, I always start with the bow. Um, that Larry Hurst, the great uh, uh, double bass professor for so many years at Indiana University, he would say that students come into Indiana two years behind in the bow than they are in the left hand, and that's the way it had been and continues to be. So I always start with the bow, think about the bow, drawing a big, beautiful sound, and so many of the people I've interviewed for the podcast, it's the same thing, and get going. And then I have a very specific Galamian-esque uh scale scale routine that I, I change the key every week. Um, and of course, it depends on what's coming up. If an audition was coming up, this might look different. But me, I do that and move into some of the solo repertoire I'm, I'm exploring. And I always try to, I always try to start, I, I want to, I want to, Push the heaviest boulder first. So I, 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 I have a technique routine that probably takes about 30 minutes. And then I move into whatever that, that biggest uh, challenge I have is piecewise. And, and then I, I mix it up. Then I move into something that's maybe a different style. I have about eight solo pieces I'm working on right now. Some of them I'm, I'm like touching once a week for upcoming recitals. One, I really want to play this piece. It's called The Corral by Nicholas Walker. It is just so bloody hard. Uh, and I have had a couple recitals come and go that I've been, ah, can't play it yet. Can't show that in public yet. And so I'm, 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 that's another one of my uh, important but not urgent projects. And I try to save the, like, well, I've got this gig coming up or whatever. I try to save that music more for the end of the practice session. Cause to me, that's a little bit of the, you know, uh, rearranging deck chairs and the Titanic sort of stuff. Like I want to work on my hard licks from Harry Potter that I'm playing or that I was playing a couple weeks ago, but I don't really care that much, um, about long-term on that. So that's kind of how I structure my practicing, but I, I am in a, I probably don't play the bass much more than, I mean, like two hours of practice in a day would be a really heavy day for me. Um, I, I'll tell you one more thing that I've learned from interviews is I have rarely, and it might be very different in the piano world or the violin world, I don't know, but I have, anybody who's, I have rarely heard people talk about spending much more than three hours a day, even in hardcore audition mode on the instrument. Uh, now I'm not talking about playing gigs and concerts, but in the practice room, that that's a commonality I've heard. So I've sort of become convinced, uh, at least for myself, that if I, if I can't get it done in three hours, I'm probably doing it wrong or I'm uh, overdoing it. Um, so that's kind of how my practicing looks and just kind of how my day looks. And it's different from day to day. Some days I do have something in the morning, but I try to reserve that morning time for um, b- both practicing and digging deep into the projects that I that are important to me. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's like you say, when you were students, sometimes we have this luxury of time, we can work on the same piece 
for a whole semester mm -hmm. and we can afford to waste time in the practice room but as professionals the results need to be uh, they need to happen so much quickly so much more quickly and mm -hmm. you know it goes into what you were saying and what why it's so great to study music is it teaches us problem solving and I, I i love that you brought this up can we dig into this a little bit like if we break it apart what does problem solving look like for you yeah it's it's um macro micro macro uh and uh, and i i do that with with my uh with my various other projects it's the same if i'm writing a blog post i tr i try to look and think big and then go to the smallest possible chunk and and try to solve that chunk and for for I, I another another tool I use that has aided me greatly, uh, not to make it all about apps, but Fourscore. Oh my goodness, I've been using Fourscore for for teaching for a while, more recently for and for playing bass for a while. But the last year or so, I finally got an iPad Pro, so I got a nice big paper sized device and I got the Apple pencil. That's a considerable expenditure of funds. That's the problem with this setup, but oh, for, it's so great. I take so many notes on my music now in Fourscore, and I I'm using different colors for different things. I'm trying to sec So I'm chunking pieces into different bars and I'm numbering the chunks and I'm practicing the certain chunks. And then on the iPad, I can just erase that stuff when I'm done or save it out as a clean copy. Um, so uh, I find if I'm not, I, if I, I need to, when I'm, when I'm practicing, I'm, I'm trying to make a decision about something and I, I try to write it down as evidence of having made that decision. If I'm not writing uh, something down while I'm working on something, I'm probably not I feel like I'm not doing a good job of practicing. Um, the problem in the past is my music would look like, you know, the the music of a lunatic because it would be covered with all sorts of stuff. So I find four score helpful because it, I can use different colors and it it just seems to make the the process that I like, uh, like circling notes and writing notes to myself, like what to think about for a particular passage or what tempo I'm at or all that that makes that whole process neater. But yeah, it's, it's going back to what I said initially to your, your, the goal is to have something too beautiful to play, to share with the, the world. Um, and you start off a piece, you know, knowing there's this, be there's this beautiful, thing, beautiful thing you want to play, but you have no idea how to solve all the problems. And then really getting in and figuring out what are the problems what, or where, what, what, what do I need to, what are the issues, what are the challenges, what do I need to uh, solve and how do I solve it and how do I know that I've solved it and then how do I assemble it. And I've got pieces in different stages. It's kind of like if I, you know, some pieces are completely taken apart. It's like a, like taking a toy apart and the pieces are just lying all over the table. Some I'm starting to kind of get the pieces together. Some they're in good shape. The pieces are all together. I just need to like pull them out and dust them off. So yeah, it's a massive topic, but that's the, that macro, micro, macro is kind of the essence of practicing to me. Amen, my friend. I think I'm going to make that into a poster and put it in my studio. <laughs> I love it. Macro, micro, macro. Okay. This is great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jason, I'm, I'm using so much of your time and I'm very grateful, but there's one more question I'd like to ask you before we jump into the rapid fire sure. round, if that's okay with you. I'm very curious to know how you know, with everything that you have learned with your background and all of these many roles that you are um, playing, or I should say living rather, you know, um, how do you keep this enjoyment of performing alive? What, how, what has changed in the way you perform or the way you approach performances now with everything that you know? Yeah, well, um, one thing is I enjoy performing more now because I do a lot less of it. And uh, that's going to be different for everybody, but I'm in this sort of nice position where I don't, I, I really only take work that sounds exciting uh, or interesting in some way. And uh, that's very different from when I was full-time freelancing, where I just took 
everything. And I was driving long distances to groups I will not name and just uh, hating the heck out of the entire experience, driving much longer than I was playing on stage, right? A lot of people can relate to that. So I, I was realizing that I was, you know, I was a driver who occasionally pulled his instrument out and played and eating fast food in the cars. I was doing that and pound, pounding the steering wheel in frustration and then realizing how I must look to the person next to me in the other car. And, and for me, getting more into teaching, though I, I had in my mind that performing was the goal and the more performer I could do, the better. And I resisted the idea of any teaching for a while, maybe part of this because both my parents were teachers, who knows the psychology behind that. But um, as I started to get more into teaching and even for, once I took that high school teaching job, I started to realize how for me, teaching kind of went more towards the reason why I started to play in the first place, which is to uh, uh, be creative and explore new projects. And, and, and it dawned on me that when I was doing nothing but freelancing, I was always going to a gig set and scheduled by somebody else and playing music picked by somebody else. And, um, and, and then when I started teaching more, I realized, oh, I have more agency in picking, picking the music or total agency a lot of the time in picking the music for my private students and then starting to teach orchestra. Oh, wow, I can create these concerts and I can arrange and do all that. And so for me, I think what, what has kept performing, and now I've, I've mo moving to San Francisco, bass has taken on more of a role in my life than it did when I was full-time teaching, but I've, I've sort of tried to keep that lesson in mind of, of, uh, there's a great, I think I got this from the Tim Ferriss podcast. I don't remember who, who it's originally from, but, uh, oh, I think it's Derek Sivers who founded CD baby, very wise person, but, um, he uses a, uh, system of any opportunity that comes your way, evaluate it in terms of excitement on a scale of one to 10, but you can't use the number seven. And that's a great system because how many things in our life on a scale of one to 10 would kind of come in at a seven? We're like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I can do that. If it's an eight or above that, I mean, an eight, that, that means you're pretty jazzed about it. If it's, if it's a six, I mean, that's like a, a, almost a failing grade, right? Uh, um, so I have been, ever since I heard that, maybe I heard that uh, maybe a year ago, I have tried to use that when evaluating any sort of project that comes my, that, my way. And I think that that's helped me maintain my enthusiasm by um, saying no and saying no is hard. Um, but, but, but by taking things that really are an eight or above. And I think pretty much everything I do, I still, the occasional seven or below comes on my schedule, but um, I, I, I like that method. I think that's helped me uh, maintain my enthusiasm for playing by not doing quite as much of it and really taking things that are uh, seem really interesting to me. I've never heard of that system, but I'm kind of loving it. This It's a great idea. It's true because if it's a seven, it's very tempting to take it for the wrong reasons. Oh yeah. Well, for me, a seven is a lot of things that like, I'm not going to, I won't name the groups cause I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, uh, dump on it. But, but like he, here in San Francisco, a lot of groups that are maybe like 70 miles away. And I think, Oh God, do I want to do 70 miles each way of Bay area traffic? And I got to leave four hours early for the gig and then the gigs. Okay. But nobody's really that great. And they're okay. The conductor's not that great. I mean, that's a, but that pays just enough to be worth it that is a seven or maybe that's a six or a five but you know something with san francisco symphony heck yes that's a nine or a ten right um going in going down to las vegas to play be the guest artist for this bass workshop and work with all these uh young people that's a nine or a ten on my scale so um it's a simple system but uh and, and it's a little scary if you try that because you realize how many sevens or below do come in uh so <laughs> that's so true. And I think a lot of musicians can relate to what you said earlier about feeling like being a driver that plays music occasionally. I certainly do yeah. at times, but <laughs> I know, <laughs> Jason, I wish we had all day. You're being so generous with your time and definitely with your insightful, uh, you know, golden nuggets of wisdoms. But um, how about a rapid fire question uh, before we conclude? 
Let's do it. Um, okay. So yeah. for the people who are, you know, dreaming of a career that resemble yours, can you tell us a little bit about what your life looks like? Yeah, every day is different. So being on top of your schedule is key. And um, in the slower, my my work has a seasonal, cyclical nature because I do so many things with schools and with organizations that have a season. So though I am independent, my stuff is kind of, you know, September through May is my busy season. So I, I have to be careful in the summer when the opportunities start to present themselves that I don't make my life horrible by, by taking on too many things. Um, so, uh, if I've been smart and good, uh, I, I've, I've got, uh, I've got plenty. I'm going out of town probably one week a month, but if I wasn't smart, uh, two or three weeks a month, which is too much for me. Uh, that's, I, I like San Francisco. I don't want to be constantly leaving it, but yeah, I am when I'm in town, I, I, I work from home a lot, or I sometimes go to a co-working space here in San Francisco. I like when I'm not, I don't bring my base to that place. But I like the energy of people kind of doing things in the tech world. I find this a really interesting place uh, to live in terms of that. It's cool to walk by Twitter and Firefox and Adobe and all of that. And I find that that sort of gets me creatively fired up. I, I go to events like Creative Mornings here in San Francisco, and, and I love hearing speakers from different industries that, have, you know, everybody's kind of in the creative world, but uh, not, I would say probably very few are musicians or certainly not the majority. So yeah, it's a lot of variety. Uh, it's a lot of travel. Um, uh, but it's it's really fun. It's fun. It's fun and a challenge. But I think a good challenge being your own boss and managing all that. Yeah, and this variety is so inspiring too. Is there a performance that stayed with you throughout the years? I know that's a hard question. Oh, but you 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 let me know what you were asking. So I do have a performance. Um, I had the rare privilege. I had this really special night at uh in the iris orchestra orchestra the iris chamber orchestra based out of memphis tennessee i played with them i still play with them occasionally but i played every concert for seven years and isaac stern's son michael stern is the conductor isaac stern was going to come and play uh, a performance and just right before the performance was when he passed away and so in instead of isaac stern coming three of isaac's friends yo-yo ma emmanuel Ax and Jamie Laredo came and played the Beethoven Triple Concerto. And Michael Stern did this great retrospective before the concert of Isaac's life and played all these movie clips and everything. And that was a really, I was really glad to be a part. Talk about a moment, uh, really feeling like you're at a moment in musical history. I felt that felt so special to me to be there. And I still remember that fondly. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty historical moment, I would say. What skills do you think young musicians should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? Well, there, there's one I've been talking about for a, a while, and I still think it's true. Entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial skills, being able to like not knowing that there's much more out there than what you see in the union paper or on musical chairs, the website. Uh, I, I think that's important. I've been talking about that for, for many years and I, I, it's, it's really key. And I, the other thing is what you're focusing on. And I think that that deliberate practice and that mindful practice and, and really understanding what you're doing on your instrument. I think that's, I think that's so key. And it's, it's kind of amazing that it's not focused on more in music school. Like why aren't, why isn't, um, a performance psychology class and mindful practice class. Why isn't that on the curriculum? I mean, I know why it's not, but, but it should be. And, and uh, it, it's just such a, it, it's, it's maybe the most valuable reason besides it being a beautiful thing, you know, that's good for the world. Uh, it's maybe one the most valuable reason to play an instrument. So why, um, why is that not focused on more? So those are the two mindfulness and mindful practice and, and then uh, entrepreneurial hustle, <laughs> getting some of those skills in, under your belt. I know it's so interesting because I do have a class on mindful practice ready to go, but it's very difficult to implement new classes. The curriculums are so full already, and I think schools are reluctant to add 
new courses for their students. But I spend so much time in my you know, studio trying to teach my students how to practice. And I'm seeing students who are so short on time and are wasting a lot of the practicing time because they don't have the skills to know how to practice. And I agree with you. I think every school should have a, if there's any takers, I have a class ready to go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and if we can't, if we can't have the class, you know, what we can do, and and that's so spot on there, the, 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 the response when you propose a class like that, Typically, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I would assume is okay. Well, what do we take away? Do we take away music history? You know, that where do? We, but so what we can do is get these skills that you're exploring, mindful practice, and teaching people how to be better practices. We we as teachers, as private teachers, can be doing a better job, or public or orchestra teachers or band directors or whatever. We can be doing a better job of instilling those skills. So that so band, orchestra, choir, private lessons, those are things that are on the calendar still, are on the schedule. And so if we can get that that into those environments, I think that's what we can do. Absolutely. You know, I was going to ask you next if you have a favorite tool in the practice room, but I can sort of guess what it is these days. (laughs) (laughs) Modacity. Yeah, it's very, definitely. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's been, I remember back to when I was at Northwestern, uh, carrying around a video camera. I literally would have a duffel bag with a video camera so I could watch myself back and all these, you know, method books and audio recorder, mini disc player, microphone. And it's just amazing that my phone does all of that. So I guess my phone is probably my, my, my favorite tool. Uh, I just make sure to put it in airplane mode or uh, not, not be checking Instagram while I'm practicing. But yeah, these days I've got my iPad and my phone on my practice stand and my Bluetooth foot pedal and Modacity open on my phone and Foursquare open on my iPad. So those are my, those are my uh, Desert Island practice room tools. I know. Isn't that crazy how we have it easy these days? I mean, I remember my mom taking me to my violin lessons when I was a little girl and she's carrying around this huge boom box to record the lesson on a tape. <laughs> you know, now it yeah. fits in your pocket. Yep. Um, how about a favorite book that you would like to recommend? So I'll rec- I, I sort of recommend this with reluctance because I go through uh, periods of of in, in listening to this guy or not listening at all. But I got to recommend it because I think if if you want to get fired up, and this would definitely be uh, not uh, eighteen and over, probably there's nothing. It's just got he's profanity laced. But Gary Vaynerchuk, Crush It, or his new book Crushing It. If you want to. Uh, take ownership of whatever you're doing. He's a good person to listen to. And he's the most brash New Yorker ever and just profanity laced. So it's sad. I, I, but I was thinking about, I, for whatever reason, that's, that's, and he has a podcast too. So again, not safe for work, but although there's nothing, it's just <laughs> foul language is the only reason it's not safe for work. It, they, he's talking about very inspiring things, but if you want to get fired up and, and, and you feel like the world is aligned against you or whatever, he's, he's um, a little goes a long way, but crush it. It, it came out about a decade ago. And so it, it, some of the references are a little bit dated, but it's great. And then he has his updated book, Crushing It. So one of those two, quick read, it'll get you fired up. You'll go practice six hours that day. Um, so that's, that's my uh, recommendation. You know, I haven't read these books, but you make me want to read them. And he's so funny, has these great videos on LinkedIn. And I can't wait to see if he will end up buying the New York Jets or not. <laughs> you know, he's a, a great character. And <laughs> I, I love watching the watching these old videos of the wine library with him. Definitely, definitely someone to learn a lot from for sure. Yeah, he just makes you realize that anything really is possible. Anything is possible, and you are your own worst enemy. And the only thing holding you back is you. I think those are lessons learned from Gary V. I also heard somebody say if if you are listening to everything that Gary's putting out, you're you're just you're you're going against what Gary's message is, which is to get off your duff and go do mm-hmm. something. Um, so um, I, I I I drop in, and he he puts out a podcast episode every day. He's got videos on Instagram and and LinkedIn and you name it. But I, I like dip in maybe once every couple of weeks to Gary and I'm like, all right, I got to do my thing. And then I, and then I let, let Gary be Gary, but that's yeah. awesome. 
And what's the best advice you've ever received that you would like to pass on? Um, I think that Gary Vaynerchuk sort of advice that you are, anything really is possible. The, the, we all, we look at, we put people on a pedestal so easily, um, always, but these days I think it's easier to do so, uh, with, with things like Instagram and Facebook and you're tuning in or if it's someone, a historical figure or whatever, you're, you're looking at people's highlight reel most of the time and you're not looking at the reality of life and getting up and making breakfast to brushing your teeth and all that sort of stuff. And, um, we're all trying to figure it out. Um, people, w wherever they've gotten to in life, uh, the, the path is way more chaotic than it probably seems to the outside observer. Hindsight it does have a way of cleaning things up and making them look uh, neat and orderly and logical. But I, I really do think we're all trying to figure this out from Tim Cook to you and me or anybody listening. And, and so just believe in yourself and it, whether it's your instrument or, or some career aspiration you have, if you really move authentically, honestly, willfully, deliberately towards some goal like that, even if it's not the goal, like I wanted for how many years to be in the Chicago Symphony. Am I in the Chicago Symphony? No, I am not. Um, am I loving the position that I've found for myself in life? Yes. Did my work towards that goal, um, that specific goal or the broader goal get me here? Absolutely. So, um, Putting in good work is there's there's really no downside to that, and the, I really do think anything is possible if you if you put your mind to it. Those super specific goals, I don't think they're bad to have. Like I want to be principal bass of the Chicago Symphony. Okay, well that comes up once every fifty years, uh, most likely. So, but that driving towards a, a goal like that, or buying the New York Jets, or what have you, uh, there there's still power to that. And then if you just open those blinders a little bit more, you realize all the opportunities that 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 are there for you, or that you can create that that. Uh, good work will lead you toward. That's awesome. And one more question before I let you go. How about a quick actionable tip that listeners can implement today in their musical lives? Uh, yeah, take control of your schedule or and your time or it will take control of you. Uh, try this. Okay, first, I guess, uh, go download Modacity. That, that would be my, my first recommendation or go to their website. But uh, something that I started doing a few years ago that's made a big impact on feeling like I'm more in control is to be a little bit more uh, careful with checking email. I do not check email first thing in the day anymore. I do the, I do that some work on something. I, and I find that if I don't check email as early in the day, I spend less time on email and I spend less time on, on important email. I still get back to everybody right away. But even when I had a full-time job, I think people who have a full-time job, that's a concern that they, they want to, you know, people are, they're not going to be so responsive, but oh my, if I wait till like 9 a.m. or even 10 a.m. to check my email, I feel like I always still get back to everybody and I make more progress on what I do because email is the world's to-do list for you and anybody can get in touch with you. And as you move through your career, more people get in touch with you typically. So I, I, I say take control of your time. And a great way to do that is just try to regulate your use of email a little and, and social media, but, uh, but so I guess that would be my mm, takeaway. So good. Jason, this it's been such an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. It's full of priceless info and insight. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us today. And I know that the listeners will benefit so much from your knowledge and your example. And where can we find you? Because I want everyone listening to go check out everything that you have out there. There's so much value that you're giving us for free on so many platforms. So where can we go to find you? 
Go to ContraBaseConversations.com. Sadly, I have I have two websites that are both popular. Never do that, folks. If you're building a website, just have one. But I have a, I have a, a a blog that we've talked about my blog. That's linked to from there. But check out the podcast. Check out that episode with Mark Gelfo from Modacity, and check out what will almost certainly be coming Renee's conversation with Mark. But um, <laughs> yeah, that we like we said earlier there there's there we don't talk that much about base. And it, it's, that's the thing that I'm, that's just sort of my journey through the world uh, that I get the opportunity to put out uh, every week. So yeah, ContraRaceConversations.com and I'm on all the social uh, places you hang out. Uh, you can find me there and they're all linked up to on that website. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Jason, thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Thank, and I appreciate you doing this show. The, the, the world needs more podcasts like what you're doing. So I'm, I'm honored that you'd think of me for this and I can't wait to follow along as you continue through your journey. Thank you, Jason. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode at mindoverfinger.com. Also, I would love to connect with you, so join the conversation on social media. Let me know what inspires you, what specific questions you have about mindful practice, and what other topics or guests you would like to hear about in future episodes. I am Mind Over Finger on all platforms. Next week, I'll be talking to international flute soloist Mimi Stillman about her journey going from child prodigy to building a meaningful career through mindful practice and by cultivating her thirst for knowledge. You will not want to miss her insightful view of purposeful practice in music making. If you have the chance, please take a minute to head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Again, thank you and a bientôt.